welcome to another episode of the Training Tidbits podcast show. I'm your host, Ryan Cartledge from Animal Training Academy, and I'm extremely excited about having you here with us today and being back in your eardrums to talk all about best practice behavior management for what is set to be another amazing episode. I can't wait to dive in and learn all about today's guest and their learning odyssey. If you haven't checked the past episodes out yet, then make sure to head on over to www.animaltrainingacademy.com and you can listen to them all there. Or you can also find them on iTunes and slash or on Stitcher. There is definitely something there for absolutely everyone as well as some sensational up-and-coming episodes planned over the coming while. Just before we do get started though, I want to say a massive thank you to everyone that listens to this podcast on a regular basis, or maybe you're joining us for the first time ever. Welcome. The show is so much fun to make, and I get inspired thinking about all the people that have benefited from all the wisdom our podcast guests have shared. And today's episode is, of course, going to be no exception to this. And if you do like today's episode, then please share it as far and as wide as you possibly can. I appreciate that a lot of you are listening to this on apps, from your mobile devices and smartphones. So an easy thing you can do that is really appreciated is if you navigate to the title of the podcast around there somewhere, you'll find three little dots. And if you tap on this, it opens up a menu and one option in that menu is share. You can easily put it on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, Instagram, Snapchat, whatever social media network you use. We would be extremely grateful if you could take a couple of seconds to do that. But we will get started on today's episode where I'm going to be talking to Hannah Brannigan. Hannah is a self-proclaimed training nerd with the belief that everyone, dogs and humans alike, learn best in an environment free of criticism. Hannah breaks down complex skills into bite-sized accessible pieces and develops practical techniques that leave her students with a sense of achievement and success. She is on a mission to make training effective and enjoyable for dogs and their handlers, which means optimizing positive reinforcement techniques across species. She is fascinated by behavior and learning and passionate about bringing innovative science-based solutions to the dog slash human learning space. Hannah has a background in both human sports and biology. She now applies that knowledge and experience to the world of animal training and canine competitive sports. She enjoys training and competing with her own dogs in a variety of sports and has titled her dogs in obedience, agility, confirmation, IPO, and rally. Her competition obedience DVDs, obedience fun dementals, and beyond fun dementals have received rave reviews from trainers all around the world, and her students have earned advanced titles in multiple countries. While primarily interested in the training process, she finds the high scores, prestigious awards, and national rankings she has earned to be very reinforcing. Hannah is the host of the popular dog training podcast, Drinking from the Toilet, which focuses on the often inconvenient intersection between positive reinforcement, philosophy, and reality. So without further ado, it's my very great pleasure to welcome Hannah to the show today. Hannah, how are you? I'm great. Thank you. Hey, Hannah, before we do get started, just want to say thank you to you for taking time to come on the show today and and hang out with me and our listeners. Thanks for having me. This is going to be fun. Definitely. We're going to dive straight into the first question today, Hannah. Could you please take us back to where you started, where you first learned about positive reinforcement animal training, and maybe share a story or two from some of the first animals you ever trained. Yeah, I think the I got into it the way a lot of folks do. Um, certainly a lot of trainers. I had a dog. This was my my first dog as an adult, and he was a rescue, and he bit people, which is a problem. And through the course of trying to figure out how to how to help him, how to you know get through that and work through that, I was reading books and I was looking up you know everything that I could find, reading things on the internet, and I signed him up for a couple of trainers. The first trainer was not so dog friendly with his techniques, very traditional. And the result, of course, of that one uh, lesson was that I went from a dog who was biting other people to one that was also biting me. And I felt like that was not an improvement in the situation. So I quickly looked for other alternatives. And I, I met another trainer who uh, introduced me to the idea of positive reinforcement and the idea that perhaps aggression was rooted in fear and bringing more fear, more pain, more intimidation to the picture was possibly counterproductive, which she was totally right. And it proved that it totally was. And so she just, you know, kind of opened the door like, hey, there's this other way to think about stuff. And we could approach this using food rewards. And we could look at building the behavior that you do want and changing 
changing the emotional response that your dog has, which then in turn changes the behavior. And from there, she actually loaned me Patricia McConnell's first book, I believe, uh, The Other End of the Leash, and a Gary Wilkes DVD um, on clickers. Or, I know it wasn't even a DVD, it was a VHS. This is how long ago this was. So it was actual, an actual tape for VCR. And I read the book and I, and I watched the tape and then I got Susan Clothier's book and I read that one and I watched more tapes and I learned about Ian Dunbar. And so that was just kind of like, it opened the door. And now we have all these other ways to explain why my dog was the way that he was. And then I had so many more tools that I could use to keep him safe and myself safe and everybody else safe. And yeah, and then I kind of, you know, fell down the rabbit hole and here I am today. Hannah, what on earth is a VHS? <laughs> well, young whippersnapper. <laughs> it's... I'm just joking, but, but can... Kids, kids these days are spoiled, aren't they? Kids these spoiled. days, get off my lawn. I got to go out to the phone booth and make a call. <laughs> and Hannah, this is a, you're right. It is a story that shares a lot of similarities with a lot of people. Unfortunately, part of that story is going and initially engaging with a trainer that uses techniques that are detrimental. So a lot of, a lot of people have dogs that might not be biting people but they're quite reactive right. and they're looking for that solution that they are hannah yes. at the moment they don't have vhs's because <laughs> they've got current technology obviously <laughs> spoiled kids can you just dive into that a little bit deeper so you initially found the universal trainer it got worse and you started to come across this positive reinforcement content what can you say to these people in that situation now and, and what can you walk us through your training to get that dog into a better place. Yeah, I mean, I think that the thing that I was missing early on, well, what, you know, initially I just didn't know, right? Like I was 20 years old, I had no idea what was going on. And so I was listening to experts, of course. And the explanation was, you know, well, we have to stop him from doing this behavior. We have to teach him this behavior is wrong. Um, maybe there was a, a social construct like dominance behind that. But the the idea is that the, the lunging, the barking, the growling, the snapping, the biting, these are bad behaviors, they are wrong. And we must teach him the wrongness of his behavior behaviors by making the outcome bad, you know, with police correction, whatever. And the piece that I was missing is, well, the reason that he is behaving this way, the reason we're seeing these external behaviors are because internally he's very afraid. Uh, he's afraid of people he doesn't know. He's afraid of being hurt. And so, you know, his coping strategy is, well, I'll drive those people away. And, you know, the best defense is a good offense, right? So we certainly are familiar with that. And hopefully in the human world, it tends to be more verbal and psychological than physical, but still. So, you know, his behaviors of the lunging, the barking, the biting, these were all an effort to protect himself from a perceived threat. And the solution was not was actually not to address the behaviors themselves directly, but to address that underlying emotional state, helping him counter condition, change the way he felt about people approaching dogs he didn't know, because we also had dogs, he was super fun. And what had happened was when I brought physical punishment into a situation where he was already felt threatened, I also became another enemy. And so then that was where we got that kind of redirected defensive stuff uh, directed towards me as the handler which again, I also perceived as a worsening of the situation. And then when I saw, again, I, you know, I had a new lens uh, where I could see, you know, these are emotional expressions of a dog that is afraid. What can I do to help him feel safer? And when I changed the way I looked at the problem, can we make people approaching more predictable? Can we give him something else to do? Can I add, in, in his case, food? He was a hound mix, so food was an easy thing to add to the equation. Can I add food so that, hey, a person approaching equals food. Food makes me feel better. I feel less anxious. Therefore, I'm less likely to react defensively. And it works for me personally. It works for dogs as well. I always feel less anxious when I eat food. And so by, you know, doing some, like ultimately at the, at the early stages, it was just really basic and not terribly elegantly applied classical conditioning, you know, Pavlov, right? So instead of bell food, we had unfamiliar person food. And one of the lessons that I learned fairly early on was that, and this is also also a little bit of a social thing, so it's a little bit of a tangent, but there is no reason that unfamiliar people need to pet him, right? Like it's okay to not like strange people touching you. I also, again, also have a lot of empathy once I recognize that because I also feel that way about unfamiliar people. I have my own personal space bubbles. So it was a combination of learning to hear what he was saying, to be anthropomorphic through his behavior, to respect his needs, his his threshold, like the bubble of space that he needed around himself to feel safe, 
And then we also did a lot of training and counter conditioning so that the bubble could be something that was practical from a management standpoint. So we could shrink his bubble from like 75 feet to, you know, maybe five feet. So we could walk past somebody on the street and not have a big scene. And that was, you know, primarily done with just a really super straightforward. I wish this is, he was the sort of dog that I wish that I could have now as a client because simply not correcting him and feeding him hot dogs made a like 180 degree turn in his behavior. We don't see that very often. Usually there's way more complexity to the whole thing. But for him, for my lifestyle as an introvert, I don't need him to be a therapy dog. I'm not a therapy person. So all I needed him to do was be able to walk past other dogs and people on the street. I needed to be able to have people over my house with, you know, maybe a baby gate or a crate or something for management. And I was fine with that. And it turned out he was fine too, as as long as I, you know, made these we had this understanding, right? And then I was I was able to protect him from the threats. I was able to pair the threats with food so that they were less threatening. He felt had better feelings about these people, these other dogs. And and then, you know, giving him something specific to do, those things come together and then we were able to live a long and fairly happy life together. So for the people listening who, uh, once again, and, and maybe maybe you're not, maybe you've been working on this for a while and you, you just need a little bit more inspiration or maybe you are right at the start of your journey and, and you have a reactive dog that you've brought into your to your home or some kind of reactive animal in some kind of other setting. And, and you, you have that thought that you shared then all you need him to do is just walk past other people. Right. It just seems so simple, doesn't it? But then the road ahead, if you don't have the information, can be quite challenging. Absolutely. And and I think there's also, as a, a parent of a young child, I'm, I'm running into a lot of the same kind of feelings and baggage with parenting, which is actually kind of interesting, having now walked this path before. But there's that embarrassment, that sense of I'm doing something wrong because my dog behaves this way. So it, there's so many parallels when like my kid has a, a temper tantrum in the grocery store and my dog has uh, an emotional display, you know, at the park. Like it's it's loud. It's embarrassing. I feel like everyone's looking and judging and and they are. But also being able to separate myself from that as a trainer, like separating myself from uh, that emotional pressure of to do something, because that would normally be when I would bring a punisher, right? Like even just an expression of my own frustration, yelling, you know, maybe snatching at the leash, whatever. And recognizing that this being, this is a, you know, this is a sentient being that's having its own complex emotional life and is just interacting with its environment and the circumstances that we're in. What can I do to change this? Because I, I did feel like almost like a, a Disney-like pressure. I'm supposed to, if I'm doing, if I'm the right kind of dog owner, I'm supposed to take this dog to the dog park. I'm supposed to take this dog to street festivals and the dog should like it. And if the dog doesn't like it, then it's my fault or I'm doing something wrong or I should, I should feel embarrassed or ashamed about this situation. And um, I think one of the most freeing things for me, and I wish I could remember who to credit this to, was that like people, not all dogs love going to cocktail parties. Not all dogs love going to the dog park. They don't all love hanging out with a bunch of other dogs or people that they don't know and trying to make small talk. When of course, again, as soon as I recognized that, I was like, oh, well, that's exactly how I feel. I hate like, you know, we're going into the holiday season and, and I am looking at a stretch of holiday parties with people I don't really know where I'm going to have to pretend that I have good social skills. And that I'm not like a super awkward introvert. And it's a very effortful for me to do that. I can do it without stabbing people after 35 years of practice. But when I recognize that, okay, so there's a whole lot of dogs out there that don't enjoy going to the dog park and that that's okay. Like that's actually not a problem. And there are actually fewer adult dogs that enjoy that kind of cocktail party scenario than there are dogs that would rather have a few close friends that they hang out with have a glass of wine go see a movie that kind of thing and that was that was I think probably like half of it really was just again flipping the way that I was looking at the situation and acknowledging that that pressure I was feeling for what he should be able to do in public was totally artificial and not at all real and when I took that away again looking at just the behavior how can I describe what's actually happening and change the circumstances then it got a lot easier so a couple of things that I I think are going to be really helpful for people. I'm going to I'm going to start with social pressure. You're at the park and you, and you talked a lot about embarrassment then, mm -hmm. and and the pressure to change behaviour in the present moment in those situations so that you relieve some of your own social anxiety uh, is is pretty large, right? And I think it's something that people feel frequently with their animals and behaviours. Whether you're a dog trainer at the park mm -hmm. with your lunging, barking, reacting dog, or your uh, a keeper in a zoo who 
knows a lot about the information that we're talking about via mine and Hannah's content. However, you're being asked to do stuff you know is subpar for your animals. What what advice do you have for people who feel a lot of anxiety around this kind of stuff and they, they are constantly therefore potentially feeling dissonance in their mind about what they're doing versus how they feel. Ooh, that's a really, that's a hard question. Honestly, I don't have a good answer for that one. That's something I still struggle with. There's, there are specific situations where I've been able to let go of that. Like, you know, being at the park, um, I hike a lot with my dogs and so we'll be on the trail. And just this past week, there were two off leash dogs approaching us on the trail a solid hundred yards away from their owners. And because this is a situation that I have personally practiced so many times, I was very quick and comfortable to step my dogs off the trail, put them in a sit, stay behind me and yell in a very projecting and assertive voice (laughs) instructions to the other dog owners to collect their dogs. And this is a state park where there was a leash law in effect. So I was in the right, which helps, which does help. A little, but it also, you know, I also find myself coming into these same kinds of conflict situations. Uh, Right now, my focus is very much on competition sports. And there's, there's a lot of the same thing there in that it is very difficult to be able to separate your dog's behavior from your personal self-worth, which sounds, it sounds silly when you say it outright like that, but it's very real when you're feeling it in the moment. Um, You know, if your dog is slow performing an exercise or, or fails an exercise entirely, it's easy to feel like everyone because everybody's watching you because nobody else is busy with their own personal inner conflicts but they're they're all looking at it and they're thinking well you're you know you're a bad trainer you're a bad dog owner you're a bad person and then to leave and and I've certainly had many moments where I've left a performance and you know sat in my car possibly cried in my car and you know thought well I, I shouldn't be in dog sports I shouldn't have dogs I don't even deserve a fish and there's there's a lot of heavy stuff there in trying to you know tease that apart I think when I'm my best self I try to whatever again whatever like kind of personal kind of behavioral work has to be done but I try to to look at sort of a, a figurative videotape of what I'm seeing and describe it as if I were you know as if I were a scientist I am a scientist is it, you know what am I actually observing what am I seeing what are these behaviors how does that break down what are the you know doing a um a breakdown of the of the ABCs what are the antecedents what's the behavior that I'm seeing what's the consequence and then how can I use that information to change the outcome in the future? And again, this is a best case scenario, right? This is if I'm being the person that I, I would like to be, which is not always a person that I am on a day-to-day basis. But that's that's where I, I try to go. I do think that it helps to do a little if-then reasoning in advance, um, like do a little planning. I'm Of course, I'm a big fan of training plans for when we're working with the animals, but I also have found it very helpful to have a training plan for myself. So if I'm going into a public situation and I can anticipate that some of this stuff is going to come up, uh, maybe I'm going to a, a trial, I'm going to a dog show, I'm going to compete with my dogs, or um, I'm going to a common scenario that I would run into and that I coach my students through is going to uh, like a practice training situation where there's going to be other people there. And that's where I'm most likely to do something just really boneheaded that I end up paying for for weeks down the road. So I'll, I will have a training plan going in for my dogs, which is, of course, because I put so much effort into training plans. It will be very well thought out and detailed and very effective. And then I'll walk into this group training situation. Uh, maybe it's a practice match or you know practice dog show. And the people there will cause me to basically completely abandon that well thought out plan. And I will do something really stupid um, that's primarily based in embarrassing social pressure stuff that I don't even really like acknowledging or talking about. But it is it is what it is. There it is. We'll, we'll just lay it out there and we'll own it. And so what has really helped me is in thinking through like the same training plan steps, but for myself as the handler. If someone says X, I will do Y. Um, So just like, you know, if I cue my dog to sit and he lies down, my contingency plan is going to be, I will present a hand target and then I will recue the sit or whatever. When I walk into those training situations, I am now in the habit of having a post-it note with me where I have written just a couple of bullet points of what I'm planning to do. And I will actually hand it to the person. And this took a lot of like courage to develop the first couple of times. But if I write, you know, if I'm going in and someone's going to help me with their training, so they're going to pretend to be a judge. Um, and we're practicing an obedience routine, that person has their own ideas of what I should be doing training. And they're often very helpful in offering me advice without being asked. And before they have a chance to offer me advice, I'll say, I'm working on these things. And I hand them the post-it note that has like two or three bullet points. 
And then I, again, try to proactively, can you X, Y, Z? And most of the time that really helps because I've taken control of the situation. I'm now controlling the antecedents. I'm controlling the, the contingencies. Um, and it's not perfect. It's not magical. And it still takes a lot of, a lot of nerve, but it is easier than the self-flagellation in the car on the way home when I felt like I buckled to that social pressure and I made what ultimately turned out to be poor training choices, especially when I knew in advance they were going to be poor training choices. And I did them anyways, because it comes down to me putting my own like emotional safety above that of my dogs and above my training. And I don't like to be that person. I want to be the person who says confidently that I am here for my dogs and I'm going to work my actions or change my actions or, or plan my actions to best benefit my training and to best benefit my dog's welfare not to save me from being socially uncomfortable. And again, it's, it's not that's uncomfortable just to even say and to acknowledge, but it is. And that kind of taking control, assuming that I will be weak and have poor self-control in the moment. And the act, that simple act of giving the other person the post-it note before I have a chance to screw up has made a huge change in how those kinds of interactions go. I don't know if that was really your question, but that's one of, one of the tools that I've kind of evolved to help me through places that I know I am personally weak when it comes to applying this, the philosophy that I, that I would like to. Well, I just want to start by saying, Henny, you're great. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for, uh, you know, this is something that I aim to do on this podcast. I aim to get people passion talking. And so thank you for, <laughs> that's a Teresa McEwen. I don't I know. know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Thank you for, thank you for diving into some vulnerability there. Yeah. I appreciate that. Um, and I don't think you, you said it sounded a little bit silly, but my thinking is that people listening to this podcast are going to be identifying with what you just said. Yes, I, I think it's a universal experience, whether or not we, we have the self-awareness to acknowledge it. It took me a while to get there and it's something I still work on, but it's, that's, we all, we all feel it to varying degrees. There's definitely, you know, there's definitely people that write blogs, like, I don't care what other people think. I'm just going to do what's right for my dog. And I'm thinking that is fantastic. You are way further along your journey than I am. So I'm, I'm going to keep working. And I don't know if I believe that they don't care. I, I also don't know that I believe that because they're blogging in the first place. So <laughs> they're blogging and they, they feel the need to state that. <laughs> yeah. Hey, I told you we want to get off the first question, but there's one more thing, Coffee, we want to talk about because I think I, I love this conversation. I think confidence is a thing that a lot of people struggle with. I struggle with, I'm sure. And you've mentioned that you've struggled with in your journey. Mm -hmm. One thing that kind of stuck out to me that you mentioned throughout that entire conversation just then was. You are you are asking yourself really good questions, mm -hmm. and and I have this kind of thing that I've modified uh, from someone else, uh, and and this saying was quality questions equal a quality life, and I'm, I'm going to change that change that to say quality questions equal quality training. Yes. You said things like, "What can I do to change this? Uh, what are the ABCs?" And you, you talked about flipping, flipping the the whole idea you had in your mind. Mm -hmm. You know, asking asking, "What if I'm wrong? What if I'm wrong about how I'm viewing this behavior?" For for people listening, can you potentially offer let's say let's say three questions, three questions that people who are having a challenging time with their training, three questions they can ask themselves that are going to help generate new thoughts, new ideas. Ooh, okay, yes, I'm up for this task. Okay, so I do tend. To, I tend to circle back to that ABC contingency because that gives me a way to structure my thought process when, especially when I'm faced with something weird, something unexpected, something that I particularly something that I don't want, um, something that I don't like, and I don't know how to address it. Um, I will frequently break it down as an ABC. And so, and then I will ask myself questions that align with each of those elements, right? So I, I usually start with the C. What's the consequence? What is the reinforcement that is maintaining this behavior, uh, if it's a problem behavior that I want to change, or how can I reinforce the behavior that I want to happen? And that usually means looking past the obvious that usually, especially if we're talking about stuff beyond really like just really obvious concrete behaviors and concrete reinforcement like food, um, because all behavior has a function. And so what I'm really asking myself is what is the function of this behavior? What is, what is maintaining it? Is the animal in avoidance? And is there a negative reinforcement contingency where the animal is trying to avoid something unpleasant um, or delay, which is a, another thing, you know, is this, is there a slowness? Is there some delay that is reflecting a negative reinforcement contingency? And so then how can I, how can I change that? If the, I don't want the dog avoiding, I want to remove that. Okay. What is he avoiding? How can I change that? I'll also ask, uh, so that would be the C. And then I like, I like to work back to front because I, I love back chaining. So then I would look at, look at the behavior, you know, is this, if it's a problem behavior, what would I like the dog to do instead? What would an alternate behavior be? What would that look like? 
And I think the describing what does that look like is really critical there. And that gets us away from, well, I want him to stop doing X. If I can make a list of descriptive terms, what I should be able to see, if I were watching a video, like if I if I were you know writing, creating a, a fiction scene of what I would want to happen in this scenario, what would that look like? What would the dog be doing? What would I be doing? And how can I describe that? Because that gives me behaviors that I can break out, which are then things that I can reinforce uh, or remove reinforcement for if it's a behavior I want to want to eliminate. And I think, again, that thinking about what do I want the dog to do instead really helps me because I do want to stay away from extinction. So if I were to decide, you know, I just want to make sure, so if I just identify the reinforcement, the C, and I want to eliminate a particular behavior by not reinforcing it, well, then I'm putting the animal into extinction. And so, of course, with extinction comes frustration, potentially aggression, and a lot of almost as much follow-up, maybe more, you know, as is punishment. So I tend to be, I tend to think a lot about that right now. And so thinking about what I want to happen and how I can reinforce that keeps me out of that extinction zone, which also helps prevent some of the, because a lot of, a lot of training problems that we encounter are the result of frustration because we've accidentally put the animal into extinction. Whether we, you know, again, whether we meant to or not, we are delaying access to reinforcement, which is resulting in an extinction type of situation. And so there's a behavior that was reinforced that's now it's not being reinforced. And that's frustrating, uh, which of course then puts me into an extinction situation because then I feel frustrated. So yeah, so you know, what do I want the behavior to look like? How can I describe that? How can I break that down? So that would be my B. Uh, and then again, the last one would be the A, the antecedent. What are the circumstances that are setting this behavior off. And that could be, again, concrete, a, a handler-directed cue. Is there something that I need to do to change the cue? A common example that I see a lot with my students, uh, there's a, an exercise in obedience where the dog has to, uh, you're calling the dog towards you. So you, you leave the dog on a sit stay, you walk 50 feet away, you call the dog a recall, the dog comes running towards you. And when the dog's somewhere between, you know, halfway and about two thirds of the way, you cue them to suddenly lie down. So they're supposed to suddenly from a dead run, stop moving and lie down on the spot. It's the drop on recall. And there's a lot of mechanics to, from the dog's part to being able to stop quickly from speed and lie down. So if you imagine you're running across a field and all of a sudden you have to stop running and lie down as quickly as possible, it's traditionally taught, of course, with aversives because it's a really fast way to get someone to duck and lie down. But we don't want to do that. We want to look elsewhere. And one of the common kind of troubleshooting problems that people will come to me with is the dog lies down fine when they're right in front of them. And then when they try to add distance to it, the down disappears. They, in their opinion, are queuing down. Down, and the dog just keeps right on coming. And when we look at what's actually happening, there is a cueing problem. They're saying down, but as they say down, they're like their head and shoulders will drop. It's usually a remnant of luring the dog into the lying down position. If you if you're luring the down position by taking a treat and putting it in front of the dog and then lowering that treat to the ground, so the dog goes into a down following the treat, your head and shoulders and upper body are going to go down with the treat because that's how you know arm bones connected to the shoulder bone. And then what happens? It becomes part of our habit. And when we add the verbal down, we're still lowering our shoulders. And so the cue in our mind is the word down and the cue in the dog's mind is that dropping of the upper body. And then when we add distance and you don't drop the upper body more, the cue from the dog's perspective is gone. So it looks like the behavior's disappeared, but actually you just aren't giving the cue. And it's a super common problem. I mean, I think all of us have actually done that exact thing, whether we recognize it or not, whether it was in a scenario where it, it showed up as a problem or not. But it becomes an issue in competition and people, most of us train entirely too much on our own and we don't, we don't notice that we're doing that little unconscious movement, but boy, the dogs do. And so the solution is, well, I need to clean up that cue. I need to actually get the cue for down to be the verbal down, if that's what I'm going to be using in, in the performance and eliminate that small physical gesture that has become part of it. So that's one of the things that I'll look at is, is what the dog, looking at the antecedents, is what the dog is perceiving as the cue the same thing as what I am perceiving as the cue? And that right there encompasses a huge area of miscommunication that results in training problems that people will feel really stuck on. Yeah, I think so. The, the three questions, and I, and I love them, I absolutely <laughs> love them. I, I really, really do. I mean, I think they are the first three questions that come into my mind. What's the function of this behavior for this animal? What do we want this animal to do instead? Yep. And what are the antecedents? Yes, exactly right. They're basically, what, what, what's the ABC, but breaking it down into three different Much shorter version than my stream of consciousness. But yes, you've got it. That's it in a nutshell. <laughs> 
a stream of consciousness, I think, added layers of understanding. So, people, because I think I, I kind of refer to it as putting on your your, your behavior glasses. Uh, and yes. After after asking yourself those questions repetitively, the logic is that they will become semi-automatic. Right. Hopefully. Yeah, yeah. So when you when you're looking at behavior, it's just like, like I imagine like Terminator movie. You know, like it kind of goes into like the Terminator's vision. Mm-hmm. I don't know if you've seen that movie. And it's like I saw it. Like I saw it on VHS. Stuff, like, oh, yeah. no, I don't know what that is. And, <laughs> and like he's processing data in his vision. Right. Yes. Yes. I'm kind of like I. I would it, like, totally ADT. aspire to be that kind of cyborg for sure. <laughs> <laughs> the behavior yes. cyborg. Behavior analytical cyborg. Cool. <laughs> Hey, so wonderful. And I absolutely love hearing about people's behavioral odysseys. So thank you very much for sharing, Hannah. Yeah, happy to. Moving forward, I would really like to talk about what you're up to now. What are your current ventures? Can you tell us about Wonder Pups in your business? Sure. So right now, my primary focus is in mainly the competitive dog sport world. My specialty is obedience. That's where I, I have most of my experience. And uh, although I do, I'm a big fan of cross training. I don't know if you know that's possibly like just part of an expression of adult ADHD, but it is what it is. So I do tinker in a lot of other sports as well as kind of specializing in the obedience world. And one of the kind of one of my, my missions is I really want to see more skilled positive reinforcement trainers entering that world and showing folks that that it works and you know, this crap works <laughs> it's i think for a long time and and still the obedience and and i think also to a certain extent the the ipo schutzend world those competitions are held as a little bit of a gold standard for what is you know pr- premier dog training methodology and of course for decades, they've been dominated by people training with traditional methods. And I, I think, and so then that's used as a, a claim to continue supporting those methods. And I think it's a little bit of a false claim. You know, we, we do it this way because it's always been done this way. So we do it this way. And that's, there's a circular logic there. And I also, on the flip side of it, there's this, let's call it a rumor in the positive reinforcement training community that obedience and dog sports are very punitive and that everybody who does dog sports uses aversives. And so, it, you know, it's really not fun and it's not for positive dog trainers. And again, there's a circular logic problem there where, of course, if you tell everyone that there's only punitive trainers, traditional trainers in this circle, and you don't ever go there, then that's always going to be true. And I know that in the positive reinforcement community, we have so many just really skilled and talented trainers that have all the skill that they need to enter and compete successfully and win at these sports that it's if we were to get all of those folks who had the skill and actually get them, we could totally flood the industry and change that whole equilibrium in, in our favor. So kind of my you know, one of my projects is I want to lower the activation energy required for those committed clicker trainers, positive reinforcement trainers to get in the ring for the first time and see that and, and show folks, you see that they themselves have, they do have the skills to be successful and to show other folks that they have the skills to be successful. And you know what, not only do they, can their dogs do it, but they can do it and be really flashy. And it's really cool because we have the technology to do all these things. And it's not, you know, success in that area is not, does not have to do with with methods, but just application more than anything. So yeah, so I want to see, and it's, it's partly, partly selfish because I enjoy competing and I want to have more friends and more people to hang out with and geek out with on dog training and behavior stuff in those events. And I know that they're out there and I want to make it easier for folks to come and make sure that they, they can join so we can totally change the culture in those sports. And I'll be your friend. Okay, deal. <laughs> I can't come to North Carolina unfortunately <laughs> and so this mission and and you spoke really passionately about it then and it's a wonderful mission i'm sure every single person is going to agree on that this, this has kind of led you on to presenting at karen Pryor academy regularly and and you've got this platform now to to get this message out there and and with your podcast and hopefully move towards that that mission yeah um it the everything's kind of happened by accident to be completely honest but that's i guess it's just how the world turns yeah so it's it's uh, i'm not super comfortable using the word platform because it sounds really formal and like i know what i'm doing and i don't but yeah it's 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 really cool being able to uh, go to clicker expo every year and talk about really nerdy concepts particularly in the area of 
uh, obedience and competitive dog sports that most people would think are crazy to spend 90 minutes talking about. And yet I can go on, I can, I can talk about sit for hours, you know, but it's, <laughs> so it's, it's, it's a lot of fun. I, I learn a lot. And I also, I love meeting one of the things that's really cool working with KPA and teaching at Clicker Expo is I, I get to travel and I get to meet so many other trainers and work with all these different teams. And I get to see the stuff in action. And that's really, really cool. And so I, I always end up learning as much, if not more, than what I set out to teach from the, the folks that are attending. I love it. And that's going to be the name of this podcast. <laughs> I can talk about sit for hours. <laughs> <laughs> it's wonderful. And so you've got this way, not platform way, yeah. of sharing this information. You, you're part of Frenzy Dog Sports. You've got your podcast show. You've got DVDs. Can you just tell everyone listening where they can go to find out? Mm-hmm more information about Wonder Pups and, and all the other stuff here. Absolutely. On. So I, the easiest is probably to go to wonderpupstraining.com. Um, that's my my website where I work very hard to try to keep it up to date on all my different projects. And that's so that's where you'll find pretty much everything where I'll be and what I'm teaching and what I'm doing. And I've also got the podcast uh, Drinking from the Toilet is linked through there. You can also find it on iTunes and all the other podcasty places. And then I do a little blogging in between, and that's also on that. So it's a wonderpupstraining.com. You can also find us on Facebook, and I am on Instagram and Twitter. Nice, and links to all the other Frenzy KPA DVDs and stuff is accessible from your yes. website? yeah. Everything's linked right from there. Fantastic. Keep it simple. Including, including drinking from the toilet. Exactly right. <laughs> And I have a question for you before we move on. Is crap a swear word? I mean, I suppose it is by intent, but it would be a, a very, very PG swear word. I love, uh, I just want to tell everyone this thing about the conversation we had a few weeks oh. ago. <laughs> where I, 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 said, I said to you, I had to tick the box that said one of my recent episodes was explicit because someone said the S word and you said, really? I just marked my whole show as explicit before I even started. I mean, it's called drinking from the toilet. Right. <laughs> what do you expect? So I was getting my, I was getting my tick handy <laughs> to uh, mark this. Mark this episode as explicit. We've we've only had crap thus far, so I have to check the podcasting etiquette. I told you, I, I work really, I work really hard to stay, you know, in a professional zone for other people's podcasts. For my podcast, you just get like full, undiluted Hannah Brannigan. <laughs> we have that. We have that explicit option so you know we want you to once again Teresa McEwen we want you to passion talk so if you need to if you need to do some f's and s's then do what I gotta do if, if that's if, if that's what we gotta do to get the real Hannah out then uh just feel all like right it. and one, one more thing I want to talk about before okay. we move on because I'm from New Zealand and we are very big on a specific type of sport here called rugby oh. <laughs> yes how is it that you in North Carolina have a dog called rugby? Oh, you know, it's it's actually, it's not that interesting of a story. I had, I, I got this puppy and he was awesome. And I was trying to pick a name. And of course he's a border terrier. So he needs a properly British sort of name. I mean, obviously not that my Belgians have Belgian names, so that doesn't really follow, but never mind. Don't worry about that. Ignore that part. But really ultimately it, it, I had a friend who had a, a fox terrier long, long years, years and years ago, whose name was rugby. And he was just like, he was like such the archetypal terrier in his terrierishness. And after spending a week with this terrier puppy, my rugby, he was very terrier <laughs> in, in all his terrierishness. And he was so, it was actually very interesting in the universe loves balance. So I have my other dogs are, I had my hound mix who's, who's now passed, but I have um, Belgian shepherds and this border terrier is like the, the complete inverse. He's like the anti Belgian and I was like, you're the most terrier's terrier. And so like, well, I should name you rugby. And so I did. So it's in honor of an older dog. And I've since learned that apparently rugby is a fairly, actually fairly common name for terriers. And I can see why. I did not know yeah, that. Yeah. He, he likes to, he likes to pile, pile into stuff. <laughs> Maybe you should target your, your Facebook posts at New Zealanders with your dog rugby. And I think it will just have success because of that. Perfect. That'll be good. I will work on that. I'll add it to my marketing plan moving forward. <laughs> Fantastic. Hey, thanks for sharing all of that. That was a lot of fun to learn about. For our next question, I want to talk about something we've already mentioned briefly. Well, not briefly. We talked about it a little, a little bit at the start. And that is training plans. I, when I was stalking you before this podcast, went to your website and downloaded your template and your video which is great and completely free for anyone that wants to check yes. that out we'll leave it we'll leave a link to that in the write-up for this episode it's just from the home page of your website is that right correct? yeah it's right there on the front awesome and i appreciate that your training plan is structured for agility performance but 
I thought there was, is that, is that correct or am I wrong? Oh, I, I mean that you could use it for, I have it with sport trainers in mind. I mean, again, I'm, I mostly do obedience. I think I include examples from both agility and obedience because those are, those are the two places where I, I spend the most of my training time and effort. But it is, I did write it with kind of sport focused training in general in mind. Well, as someone who doesn't currently actively engage in too much sport dog training, I could see that there was huge value in it for anyone doing any sort of training, and specifically in, in numerous areas. I was having a conversation with someone on Facebook yesterday who used the word tedious to describe writing training oh, plans. yes, yes. I've used that word also, I see. yeah. <laughs> I see huge value in them. And, and and you talked about, and we've talked about in podcasts recently, confidence in training. Mm-hmm. And one way you helped develop, tell me if I'm wrong here. This is what I've taken away from what you shared with us. One way that you developed your confidence was by being organized and, and having that post-it note that you could hand over and thinking through the if-then possibilities before you went into your training situation. So I, I'm really curious to explore with you moving forward how we can make this less tedious and encourage people to engage in this stuff because I think it's just got such huge value. Yeah. Um, so I'd love, I'd love to have a discussion with you, how, how you structure your training plans and, and what advice you have for the listeners. Yeah, I think, I mean, I think that's, that ex, again, that experience is fairly universal. Uh, there, I do believe that there are people out there, they're probably working in like chemical engineering or something that like love a spreadsheet. I am not that person. I am not a naturally organized person. Planning in advance is not something that comes easily to me. It's very effortful. It takes a lot of mental energy. But what I have discovered is, is in order for me to, to do do the things that we talked about earlier to be able to separate my emotional reactions from making good training choices. I am best served by doing the cognitive part of training before I have the animal in front of me. If you break training into two big categories, like the, our training skills, there's the mechanics of actually like clicking and delivering the, the reinforcement. And then there's the cognitive aspect of planning and observing and doing the thinking of those if then statements, what will I do if this happens? How do I break that down? And it is difficult to impossible for me. And I suspect most people, I think we will say that it's not or lying to do those things at the same time. By automating a lot of my mechanics, by automating my clicking and my food delivery or my toy delivery, I've been able to free up a lot of brain space to do more cognitive stuff during training. But I'm still, there's just no way for me to have 100% of my brain on planning the session while I am doing the session. I, it slows down my responses. There's just no way around it. So the, the main benefit I view from doing the planning before I get the dog out is it lets me split those tasks up. So now I can do the thinky parts, the cognitive tasks when I'm not frustrated, like I'm, I'm sitting in my office, I'm sitting in my living room, I can have a glass of wine, I can create my own reinforcement contingencies around this. <laughs> and I can you know, think through when it's not happening. Because if, if something goes wrong in the training, and I'm in the moment, I am going to be immediately blocked from my reinforcement for training. Like if I'm trying to train the dog to a particular behavior, and it goes sideways, the my reinforcement for that training session was getting that behavior, right? And if I'm blocked from that behavior, because something unexpected happened in the training session, I will experience frustration because I am in an extinction situation, right? And as soon as I'm frustrated, I start making poor choices. This is just something I know about myself. So part of my t- job, my task is to prevent myself from feeling frustrated by planning ahead. I can set myself up for success. Gosh, it sounds like I'm treating myself like a learner. And when I take my own advice, it tends to work out really well, which is one of those crazy things. I look at it kind of layer by layer. On the one hand, there is my like longer term goal. And so like how I have this laid out in the training plan on my website is like, first, what are all the things I want my dog to learn? Whether it's a, a puppy that I want to just learn to be an enjoyable companion around the house, whether it's a working dog, a sport dog, can I just list out all the things that I want that dog to learn? What I, I think I only have like one column on the on the template on the website, but when I do this in real life, I normally actually end up with like a couple of columns because I'll start with like the big tasks. I want my dog not to be a jerk at the front door. And then that splits out into, uh, so it'd be like a column one and then like column two would be, okay, well, what does that actually look like? And then, and then column three might be splitting that into behaviors. And then those are the things that actually go on my training plan because like not being a jerk at the front door isn't a good training goal. I tend to kind of work laterally like that, but it's it, brainstorming. What are the things that I want to do with this dog in the next, you know, six months or whatever. And then I use, this is kind of loosely, I, I read a lot of, when I, re, when I recognized that this was a big weakness for me, 
and that to get better, I was going to need to get some new skills on board. I, I went out and did a bunch of research. And so I read so many books out there because productivity is like such a, a, a holy grail, I think. Um, nothing to do with dog training, just like human, like how to, how to manage your time and not suck at stuff. So um, like I, I, I use, I referenced the 12 week year a lot. I can't remember the author of that one. I did a bunch of reading of like agile project management because training an animal is very much like project management for people. In fact, project management for people, like if you're developing computer software, it comes down to breaking tasks down and then deciding when you're going to do those tasks and how that's going to play out. And that's very much what a training plan is. So um, so the way I approach it is sort of a combination of those sort of productivity elements with like a project management thing. And, uh, and so I tend to work on a two week cycle. So I have my, my list of things that I want to accomplish. And then I break those into what are the next two weeks? How am I going to work on that? When am I going to do it? And what am I going to work on? And the reason I do two weeks is because I work most weekends as a dog trainer. So trying to do it every week was not working for me. Whereas uh, it is easier for me to find one hour every other weekend. So it's a two week training cycle. And so then I have, I'm only looking at the next two weeks. What's that going to look like? What are the things that I'm working on? And it's all in pencil, but by doing the thinking that Sunday night in advance before I get into the week and we get, you know, flooded with making lunches and picking up from school and, you know, all that stuff on Sunday night when it's relatively quiet, have a cocktail. And on Monday, I'm working on this. And on Tuesday, I'm working on this. And I have my list of behaviors next to me. Um, and I usually will prioritize those. Like what, what is, right now is the weakest link. It's this one, this one, and this one. Great. So that's my focus for the next three weeks or next two weeks. And then on the, you know, I'll train that through week one, that weekend, and we get back to the alternate Sunday night. I have a little really simple review process, not formal at all, but what did I actually do in the last two weeks? And sometimes the answer is, so maybe once the answer was, yes, I did all these things and I was amazing. And often the answer is, okay, I got half of that done. Um, and then I can carry that over to the next two weeks. So um, just by making that rhythm of the weekends that I'm home on Sunday evening, I pull all the video off my phone and airdrop it onto my computer. I look at what I had thought I was going to accomplish the last two weeks and I use that information. I spend a little bit of time in reflection. I think reflection is a really important part of that. And that, and for me, that takes the form of watching the action. I try to video most of my training sessions when I can, and I just use my phone for that. Again, really informal, but just to have a record. And I just watch those through and I will keep some, I'll delete a lot of it. And that that lets me, again, see as objectively as possible what actually happened. Um, sometimes I will go... Uh, a little, I'll go a little more in depth. Like I might actually count a response rate depending on what I'm working on. But a lot of times it's literally, I'll just watch that video through and I'll like, mm -hmm, okay, well that was terrible. Let's not do that again. And I'll watch another one through That one actually worked pretty well. Let's use that food delivery next time. And then I you know, plan what I'm going to work on for the next two weeks. And so that's that in that way, I keep working through what are the three weakest things on my main list right now? That's what I work on this week the end of those two weeks, now what are the three weakest things? And then in the next two weeks, now what are the three weakest things? And usually it changes. And that way I'm always keeping everything moving forward a little bit. But again, you know, it's doing the deciding when my brain is not so busy, when I have the energy to do it, I can make the decisions. And then I don't have to decide when the dog is in front of me. So my timing is better because I know what I'm reinforcing. Um, so my clicks are more clear. If at any time during a training session, I find myself looking at a response and thinking, is that straight enough? Is that close enough? Was that fast enough? Should I click? That right there is a big red flag that I need to account for that in my planning before the dog comes out. The moment it takes me to think, should I click? Whether I was going to click or not, the moment to click has passed. And so I can't make that decision in the moment. I need to decide in advance what that's going to look like. And then my timing is so much better. My reinforcement is so much cleaner. And so the sessions are way more efficient and I dig fewer holes. And really anything to improve timing should be taken pretty seriously. Uh, totally. You, you see this, it's all about freeing up brain space yeah. and decreasing those poor choices. And you also said, it seems like you're treating yourself as a learner. <laughs> you mentioned drinking wine and cocktails and making making this process actually reinforcing for yourself. And, and I'm going to make an assumption here for you going through this process yourself and teaching yourself how to do this over time. The reinforcement was seeing results as well. Yes, I surely hope so. Yeah, <laughs> I think, but I, you know, I think actually a closer, there's a negative reinforcement contingency if I'm honest with myself, because feeling less anxious about whether or not I'm going to screw this up, just unloading that out of my head makes me feel better, feel a little bit less like I'm on fire while I'm trying to train, you know, so that, that sense of relief, I also then do more training. 
Um, I have found that on a busy day, like today, I was running around. I'm single parenting all week this week. I have, of course, 1.5 full-time jobs or more. And so I wanted to train my dogs. I love training my dogs. But if I have to use, I have 10 minutes. And if I don't know in that 10 minutes what I should train, I will either not train at all or I will train poorly. And then I'll be mad at myself because I won't have used that time well. It's, you know, it's a limited time to begin with. Whereas if I have a whiteboard up on my door here with what I'm working on right now, and all I have to do is glance at that whiteboard, grab a handful of treats, and boom, I can work both dogs through a 10-minute you know, training session, broken up. Um, I feel a lot more accomplished in the moment. And of course, I also tend to make more progress because it turns out that training your dog at all works better towards uh, progressing towards your goal than not training your dog. I've tried both because I'm a scientist, and I can tell you um, that we get better outcomes from training than not training. <laughs> Hannah, what's, what's on your whiteboard? Is it just your goals? Uh, what I throw up on, I have a lot of whiteboards actually. Um, the one that I'm referencing now is I have a, just a really small whiteboard. It's on um, like the cabinet door next to where like I keep the treats and, and it's right next to the dog crates. And on that whiteboard, I have a column for each dog and I have under it two or three things that we are focusing on that week, taken from my two my two week plan. And then I usually put underneath that some one or maybe two things that I am tracking during that training period. So for example, right now, uh, rugby, uh, my young border terrier who's working towards, um, hopefully we're gonna be making his uh, novice debut in obedience this spring. And so we are working on a couple of specific training tasks. We're working on an offered call to heal behavior with distractions. And I have a couple of specific distractions that, that are, uh, that I'm working through. Um, we're working on his sit stay and we're working on his leash on r ring routine behavior uh, at the end of the performance. So those three things, those three items are written kind of in shorthand. They make sense to me. It wouldn't make sense to somebody else necessarily under his name on that board. And then underneath it, I have just a, a series of check boxes for tracking when I actually work on the sit stays because that behavior is not one that I find um, very exciting to train. So I have to bring some external reinforcement and make sure that I actually train it because I don't want to get to the point where we're ready to compete, but he has to do the sit stay and I've not really done it because it's boring. So I get to make a check mark every time I actually work on his sit stay. And my goal is to do that four times during that time period. And so the sooner I get those four check marks, again, I get, I get that sense of, I'm, I actually am not terrible at this. I'm, I'm actually getting something done. And it's actually kind of cool because, you know, whenever you're doing any like of the star chart things, I think, I think I read a quote from like Jerry Seinfeld, like when you, you know, you make a mark on the calendar every time you work on the thing, maybe it wasn't Jerry Seinfeld. I'm making that part up. I'm not sure. It really sounds made up now that I say it out loud. But anyways, you, you start making the check marks and seeing the check marks there is motivation to make the next check mark. You get the behavioral momentum. And so that's, that's how I lay out my whiteboard. I have like the three things that we're focused on that also so it helps me avoid like the shiny object problem, squirrel, and then one or two things that I'm tracking. I used to do like eight things that I was tracking and then that just, it was overwhelming and I would just ignore it and block that off. I'm really good at avoidance and denial personally. So, but one thing, maybe two things like working on stays or maybe working on stays and some kind of conditioning task, those get check marks. And when I see those check marks, I want to make more check marks. Check marks are cool. I like check marks. And so that helps me bring some, some structure and some motivation so that I actually make progress. I like this. And, and where I want to take it is for everyone listening, the benefits are freeing up your brain space, improving your timing, minimizing poor choices in the actual training session. I want to address as well, and we've been addressing it, I want to build on it, the, the actual process of doing all of this stuff. And as you said, treating yourself like a learner. So we've identified a couple of things. When you're sitting down and doing this, treat yourself. Get something you like. If it's a glass of wine or a cocktail or some chocolate, something. It should be a green smoothie. It could be something very healthful and a virtuous. A green smoothie, yes. Some broccoli. Yes. And, and just make that a, a pleasurable time as well. Additionally, you had some great input there about tick, check boxes or, or stars. Uh, don't overcomplicate it, but make sure that you've got a visual reference to the fact that you're actually doing things. Make yourself feel good. Do you have anything else to add here? How can we make this reinf how can we make the actual process what i've more reinf yeah what i've found is most important is again take that successful approximation approach with yourself find the simplest smallest movement in the correct direction to, to get the ball rolling to get that behavioral momentum going so 
for most of my students, what I have them do is I, I really the first, the most important thing. Well, there are two. There are two most. They, you can't pick two most important things. Let me circle back. <laughs> is is doing that that pre thought. So if they write down one thing for their two weeks, just pick one focus for their two weeks. We'll call it, sometimes we call it a theme for their two weeks, but sometimes people get hung up on the language. So doesn't we'll use the word focus. We know what's your focus. I'm going to build motivation in healing. Great. And I'll leave them alone with that for a couple of weeks. But then the next time we'll come back and like, what are you working? You know, I'm focused on on building precision in my stationary heel pat position. And what I love is that if I do nothing, they start making that one thing more precise. They use clearer language. And I think what we're seeing is that effective reinforcement. Because if I say, you know, I want to build more motiva- motivation and healing. Well, that's a lot of labels and that's a big task. Like that's not one behavior. That's not a training plan. But they've thought it out and then that gives them something to kind of to hold while they are training. So if they do another planning, at least at one point on that Sunday, they thought I'm going to build motivation and healing. And so that tends to color their training for the next two weeks. And when we meet back, they in and of themselves take it to the next level and they will add another layer of specificity. They'll break it down a little bit better on their own. And then I can say, great, that's fantastic. You're doing a really good job here. Um, <laughs> it's a good plan. And, they'll, and then they'll carry it out and then uh, and they'll go from there. And when we do it with that kind of a path, it tends to stick a lot better um, most of us have like the normal pattern is we resist doing anything for a while. And maybe we even like poo poo other people who are trying to do it or tell us to do it. And then when we decide we're going to do it like planning or weight loss or whatever, we don't just change one thing. Like I'm going to eat dessert only on Tuesdays. We try to, to do a whole lot of stuff all at once and it's not sustainable. So like, I'm going to, I'm going to be vegetarian starting today and eat no dare and paleo vegetarian and fair trade. And then you get you know really excited and use up all of that excited starting energy in, you know, in the first three days or eight hours in my case. And you, you go back to what you're doing before and we'll do the same thing. You know, I'll see people like I'm going to do plan all my training sessions. And so they sit down with their calendar. They plan out these super detailed two weeks and they do that the one time and then they don't do it again for six months, which doesn't help. Whereas just like picking one thing, what are you going to focus on for these two weeks or do it weekly? If, if you don't work weekends, that weekly works well for a lot of folks, but I'm just picking like the one focus, focus point. Um, the one thing you're focusing on for that training period and then letting it kind of build naturally is that I think that's a good first step in that successful approximation thing. I like it. And last safe word, poop. Yeah. That's the other yeah. One. It's one not one. explicit. Child safe. I like lists. And we've come up with three things people can do. So come up with a, a theme or a focus for two weeks. Did I, did I sum that up correctly? Yes. Yep. Treat slash reinforce yourself whilst doing this and, and you'll know you've been reinforcing yourself correctly depending on if you continue to do the process moving forward number three have a way to mark success tick boxes or gold stars whatever yeah. floats your boat before we move on let's just add one more what what's something else that people can do to make the process of writing training plans just planning prioritizing this tedious a higher higher probability behavior yeah um <laughs> I think the, the 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 last thing that I would add is to make it part of the routine. Um, so that brings in the, all the cues and antecedents of your normal day to day. So f- again, for me, it's Sunday evenings. Um, Sunday evenings are kind of already our get ready for the week day. And I'm not someone who can stay up late at night. So I'm a by evening. I mean like three o'clock in the afternoon. But, but yeah, but that that you know that that Sunday Sunday evening Sunday afternoon time we're we're getting stuff ready for the week. We're making sure we have you know groceries and all this stuff for like living and make sure we have food to eat. So it makes a lot of sense for me to make my training plans part of that same kind of routine. So picking a specific time, when am I going to do this? Putting it into that routine and making it happen just like brushing your teeth or going to the bathroom when you first wake up, like it just becomes, this is what you do. And when it's, it's maintained with that whole, and within that whole antecedent structure, it's way less work than when you're trying to, I need to make sure to find time to do my training plan before next week. No, no, no. On Sunday afternoons, I do my training plan as soon, you know, as soon as, you know, we get my daughter down for her quiet time. And then I come down here and I plug my phone in and I have a checklist of things that I do for how I make it, I make it happen. You don't need a whole checklist, but just like on Sunday afternoons, I'm going to spend 20 minutes reflecting on my training plan. Um, and I think that giving it that time slot and it takes hard, it's a little more work at first, but then again, it becomes part of the routine. It's maintained by those ABCs around your just daily structure. And that helps it become a habit. So number four, make it as important 
is making sure you have food to eat and go into the bathroom. Yes. Make it more routine, checklist. And then in the checklist or, or the routine is it just, you, you've been, you're, you know, it's happening. Like it's Friday and you know, by the end of the weekend, you'll have this done. It's already, already exactly. going to happen because, yeah. you, because you've yep. planned it out. And I know again, that there's no decisions to make except for those about the training plan. I plug my phone in. I do the airdrop of the videos. I have the uh, last week's page right open in front of me. I'm looking at the videos. I'm looking at what I, I thought was going to happen. The videos are, the, of course, the irrefutable record of what actually happened. And then, great. Okay. Next two weeks. And it really becomes pretty automatic. Nice. And you got your mojito in one hand and your miller exactly. in the other. And some chips. Beautiful. And some chips as well. <laughs> Sounds like a party. Hey, thank you so much for all of us, Hannah. We are sadly now nearing the end of the podcast, but that's okay because we're heading into one of my favorite parts of the show. And this is story time. Hannah, could you please share with everyone listening two or three stories from your experience training animals so far and some important lessons that these have taught you? Oh, gosh. I would say probably my favorite story or like my favorite moment as a as a trainer. It's also overlaps with my my favorite moment as a parent. And that was a couple years ago, maybe a year ago, maybe two years ago. My daughter Harper was very interested in, or continues to be very interested in the dogs, of course. And I have Belgian Shepherds and a, and a Border Terrier, none of which are breeds that are really known for being like super tolerant socially or particularly interested in, they're not Labradors. Uh, and I love them for that. I love them for their non-Labradorishness, but she really wants to pet them. And I was, as a new parent, I was really, really concerned or worried that we would overface the dogs. We would, Before I was doing a lot of work in with performance sports, I did a lot of work with reactivity and aggression because of that's how I sort of came up. And a lot of that was dogs who bit kids, right? And so I was very aware of that. And I was very concerned, like, well, how can we set this up? Because I don't want to, I don't want to act like a crazy person and like overmanage the situation and make, you know, either the dogs worried or, or make my kid insane like me. Um, I want to raise her to be better and more stable. And so we actually use some tag teach and taught her, and this is where it gets really kind of beautiful, taught her to invite the dogs. So if they're hanging out and she wants to pet them, she does her little routine where she pats her knees, claps her hands, then holds her hands out. And I think it's was it Madeline Gabriel or somebody, somebody did a, a video or blog about it. And, and so we borrowed from that. And, and she was probably right at two years old when she was able, like motor skills wise to do this, she learned to do it. And then the dogs will choose and you can see them look and, um, and like Gambit, who's my big, big intact male, very kind of touch sensitive. And he will look at her, turn sideways and push his chest and shoulder into her open hands and she'll rub his his big beautiful mane and you can just see him enjoying the interaction and i can kind of sit there in kind of awe almost at how beautifully over the the last two years they have kind of built on the depth of that interaction so she'll still do the inviting he will choose and sometimes he will choose not to sometimes he'll turn his head away and go lay down on his bed um and so we work on being able to accept that but they have a dialogue between the two of them that is so just so clean and so it's so beautiful where she can invite him he can choose to come and interact and then and it goes the other way as well because sometimes you know, she has food and she doesn't want them to interact with her. And that's, of course, when they are most interested in interacting with her. And and even before the, even before she was verbal enough to do that tag teach, she developed a cue of holding both her hands up in front of her face when she thought the dogs were going to come up and like lick her or take her Cheerios. And that evolved in through cue transfer into this beautiful, um, they see her hands go up over her face and they turn away and there's no conflict. There's no stress about it. It's just communication. You know, she invites them to interact. She can give them a cutoff signal and they both recognize it. And I mean, I'm always there because I'm, I'm still a little bit of a control freak. So I'm still like supervising, but that they have that in place makes me able to relax. And so that's, I think one of the one of the big payoffs in that I have personally achieved that kind of goes, it transcends competitive awards in that I've been able to see this relationship develop through that positive reinforcement methodology on both sides, which has made, again, it just adds depth to our, our whole life experience with the sharing our lives with the dogs. And you called it so, so beautiful. You said, I think that sums it up pretty well. That's a really nice story. Yeah, I love watching it. Sadly now though, that does bring us to our final question for this episode. And we've already actually talked about this. So I'm not sure if you want to add anything or you just want to say, yeah, what I said before, but for this 
final question, Hannah, could you please all take us into the future and, and share what you'd really like to see happen over the next five, 10 years in the animal training world? Yeah, I mean, I think in the next 10 years, I would love to see, and I think it's very realistic, but I, you know, I'd love to see this kind of behavior analytical approach to working with dogs become the norm. I'd like to see it normalized. Um, I would like it to be accepted. I'd love that I can walk you know, into a, a room of, of trainers of people and I can use terms like positive reinforcement, like stimulus control. And maybe not everybody has a, you know, a full definition right at their fingertips, but they can track the conversation. And 10 years ago, that, that wouldn't necessarily happen. I would have to stop and define. And I think that that's really, really cool because that, that means we're able to have a deeper conversation because we have some language that we can use. And so I'm, I would love to see that continue. I would love to see um, that acknowledgement of our learners as having, you know, emotional lives that are relevant so that, you know, we continue to look for new positive reinforcement based solutions to those old problems. And that carries into performance sports as kind of, you know, carrying the torch in the public eye. You know, we can can show that that our that the science, we can use these techniques to get as good, if not better, performances than the old techniques. And they're more accessible. They make these behaviors, uh, these outcomes, you know, the results more user friendly, more accessible to more teams, more dogs, more handlers in sports. And then also, of course, in everyday life, because that's, you know, sports are just a, a reflection of how we live with the dogs. So that's what I would like to see. Cool. And I just want to build on that just a little bit, because I was thinking about asking you something and your opinion on something earlier in the podcast. Uh, and I didn't because I wasn't sure if we wanted to go down that rabbit hole, but we're here, we're at, we're at the interest of the rabbit hole. So let's, let's at least put our foot in. How, how do we how do we normalize this? Is is this just in our bubbles that this is happening? Because there's a whole wide world out there, right, with dog mm-hmm. owners. Um, and I was having this conversation with someone the other day, and this is why I'm thinking about this because we, we we were talking about horse training. We weren't talking about dog training. Not that different, but yeah, we we're talking about well, there's different yes. sports, right? So you might be doing a dressage mm-hmm. with your horse and. And the potential methods that you use to work with that animal in that setting might not necessarily align with the ethical standards yes. that we set for ourselves. The people involved in that may or may not, I can't speak for anyone, this is very generalized, mm-hmm. be interested in that, in, in the horse's goals over their own goals. Does that make sense? Wait, say that again. They might be placing their own personal goals and desires over and above the animal's. Right. So how do we, moving forward, that we, we want to see this behavior, behavioral analytical approach. How do we, how do we step outside of our bubble though? Should, should our focus be on the people inside of our circle and being like, yeah, we feel good because we're all talking about it. Or should we be focusing more on all of these people who aren't wanting to pay attention to it? Does that make sense? Yes, but I don't have an answer. Um, yeah, I told you it was yeah, a um, <laughs> and, and the reason I asked you is because we couldn't come up with an answer I either. think what the, because if I'm, if I'm interpreting what you're asking or what your conversation was about, because it's very much the space that I live mm-hmm. in. Um, Mm -hmm. my approach is not to try to change anyone's mind. Um, in fact, this is part of like the preface in my book. I'm not looking to change anyone's mind. So if you, if you were to come to me and you don't accept my premise, I'm not going to try to change your mind, but I am going to go out there and be really awesome. And I want to teach the people who do accept my premise, the skills that they need to be awesome. And as we are all out there in the ring, being awesome in front of an audience, there will be some percentage of that audience that was on the fence and they will see the awesomeness and they will want it. And so they will approach us and they will say, I would like to know how you did that because that has actually been my life experience, right? Like my, what actually has happened to me at events, I will go in there and I will just do my thing. Me and my dog doing the best that we can with the skills that we have. And someone will stop me in the parking lot happens at almost every competition. And they will say, something like I loved your, they might use the word like enthusiasm, or they may like that your healing was really beautiful or whatever. How did you teach that? And as soon as they ask, now I have an opportunity. Now we have a dialogue, right? I'm still not going to try to change their mind, but I can give them a way to teach, to get the effect that I, to get the outcome that I had that they wanted that doesn't involve the tools that they've used before. And they'll take that hopefully if if I explain it well, and they will try it out and they will find out that that works really, really well. And if that one works really well, could I also teach this behavior with a different method? And then that's, you know, that's that, that's the success of approximation. That's the first domino, you know? So I think 
my approach is again not to I don't I don't want to preach or argue to anybody. I'm just going to be quietly over here being amazing and if you would also like amazing then you know where to find me. And I think it's that that kind of show not tell is what's going to make those changes happen. But I mean I totally like it's a tough question because I don't have a dog in my house that would rather be at a dog show than be out hiking in the woods with me. And I, and yet I will continue taking them to dog shows. I mean, I do a lot of things to make sure they're comfortable. They have fancy memory foam beds and they get chiropractic care and massage, things that I don't do for myself. So they have pretty good lives despite their com- competitions. And I think it, there's an element of the, of the greater good. And also, of course, because I have these competitions periodically that I am training towards, my dogs do get that extra enrichment than they would if I if I didn't have those things to train towards. So I think the, the balance on their quality of life is positive because of the things that we do together. Yeah. And, and maybe, maybe the dressage one wasn't the best. No, I think it's a great example. Actually, it's a completely legit one. It's just complicated. Yeah. Yeah. There's there's different people that do it, right? There's some people who are incorporating positive reinforcement in that and doing something similar to what you described with your dogs and making it a really, really great experience versus those who are like, well, I want to get the behavior from my horse, so I look good with right. dressage. There's, Maybe I'm digging myself. No, wrong. no, I no, I think it's again, I think it's legitimate. And I find myself in those kind of ethical quandaries. Like I'm here at a dog show with a dog that does not like shiny floors. This dog shows a shiny floor. What's the right choice here? Do I leave and I don't and I just don't even try? Or do I do the best I can to get across the floor? The the rings are usually have matting down so that it's not the actual performance, but the being there is stressful for her. And so and then I have to ask myself, you know, why, why, why am I doing this? And there are definitely times when I have caught myself, hopefully well in advance of making any again choices or decisions or action, where I have caught myself thinking, if we can just get this one title, you know, if we can just complete this one run. And as soon as that thought pops into my head, the shortcuts start appearing. And that's where I try to catch myself because I, I want, I'm playing a long game. And I do believe that the, the methods that I'm using are ultimately going to be as effective. I'm learning how to use them. Like I don't, you know, because we're doing things that aren't done as commonly, we don't have as many guides. We don't have models to follow, but it's part of how we describe, I describe myself. I describe the people that I follow or travel with. We, the ends don't justify the means. We want to get the ends. We just also care how we do it, but we still really want those ends. (laughs) I really want that outcome. I just want to find a way to do it that is compatible with my philosophy, but I still have a very hard time letting go of a particular outcome when I don't have a solution that's compatible with my philosophy. I still, sometimes I get stuck, you know, and that's, that's where we're still, we're still learning. We're still trying to find new solutions. But if I want to compete with my dog and she doesn't like other dogs, it's a really big training task for me to teach her to be okay around other dogs so that we can be at a dog show. And I still have to, and I still also have to acknowledge that when we're at that dog show, we are using a lot of management to maintain those behaviors. And it's a deduction from my account. Again, I think the balance is positive because of all the other things that we do that are because we're working towards the dog shows. She has a better quality of life than she would have otherwise. So I'm, that's how I maybe rationalize it for myself. But that's where I am. And I, I do. I, there are definitely people out there that there are people who, who want to say, you know, I want an obedience trial champion and that's all that they care about. And then I'm not the trainer for them. There are plenty of trainers out there who have way more you know, obedience champions than I do. There are trainers out there way more years of experience than I do. And if those are the things that are important to you, I'm not a good match. I, I'd be happy to send you elsewhere. For those people who, you know, we want the titles, we want to do it our way. Um, you know, we want to do it with positive reinforcement, then we can work together to find solutions. And usually it means being creative because it's not all solved yet. One musing for us to ponder on as we move forward is to focus more on just being awesome and let that awesomeness slowly seep into all the crevices of all the trainers. This sounds horrible. <laughs> <laughs> terrible terrible metaphor. Yeah, no. <laughs> Um, and, and that and that's where our energy is probably best spent is just focusing on on being awesome and, and, and allowing the results to speak for themselves and as more and more people see this their curiosity is going to be tempted right. and they're going to start asking questions and they're going to start learning the behavioral analytic way yeah i mean and, and i'm i'm not shy about using precise language 
I think that a good way to learn vocabulary is you learn it in context. And then if they want to, if they want to keep you know, learning, they'll either learn it in context, which most of the time it works just fine. Uh, unless you're reading, a, um, you know, a scientific paper, an article in a journal where they're, they deliberately use obfuscated language, but they, you know, they can ask, they can look it up. Uh, I mean, that's how I learned all this stuff. I didn't read a dictionary on behavior terminology. I was reading Don't Shoot the Dog and other similar books. And, and then like, well, what does she mean by this? And, and then I can go look up and read more and read more. And that's where you really get the understanding. So yeah, I think sh you show the example. Um, people who are intrigued will come and ask about it, give them a little bit of information and let them, and let them, you know, walk their own path. It's really lame, but that's what I got. Being awesome is not. No, right. no, no, no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Being awesome is awesome. Hey, hey, that's a great vision. And, and it's a huge question. And it's one I'm really interested in, in hearing everyone's thoughts on. So if you want to add something to this conversation, then we'd love to hear from you. Head to the write up for this episode on animaltrainingacademy.com and you can leave a comment in there. That does sadly bring us to the end, though. But before we wrap up, from myself and on behalf of everyone listening, Hannah, Thank you so much for making time to come on the show today and, and hang out. I really appreciate it. Thanks for having me. It. You're extremely welcome. And we, of course, really appreciate all of you tuning in today as well. I uh, want to ask a small favor of you guys listening and gals. If you do enjoy these podcasts and as a practitioner of best practice behavior management yourself, you want to share the awesomeness that Hannah expressed with us today and the information held within this episode. If you think it could help others, then please share this wherever you can on Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram, Pinterest, Snapchat, whatever you use so that as a community, we can do absolutely everything within our power to disseminate this information as far and as wide as possible. And one really easy way to do this, if you are listening to it from a podcast app on your mobile device or smartphone, as mentioned at the start of the episode, there should be three little dots next to the title. And this does change slightly between devices depending on apps. But if you click on this, there's going to be an option to share the episode and you can choose whatever social media you use or email, however you want to share it. And it's done really simple. It'll take you less than 30 seconds. And it's a really small something that you could do. If you could do that, that would be super. That's it for this episode, though. We'll wrap it up there. Thanks again so much for listening. Ciao, ciao. Brown cow. You'll hear from us again soon.